Welcome to Software Engineering Daily. This episode explores The Last Mile, a program out of San Quentin State Prison in California, which seeks to reduce prison recidivism by teaching inmates the skills of software engineering and entrepreneurship. Students within San Quentin Prison learn web development despite having no access to the internet. We hope you enjoy this episode as we focus on many of the themes of Software Engineering Daily career reinvention, imposter syndrome, and how to teach programming to anyone, whether they are a college student or attending a code school within a prison. But before we get to the show, we're going to briefly talk about the sponsors who support Software Engineering Daily. You don't have to settle for a job that makes you unhappy, and you don't have to go through the pain of searching through millions of job listings. Hired.com brings job offers to you, the engineer. Hired is a job marketplace built for the engineers. A few years ago, I was unhappy with my engineering job. I felt stuck, I felt underpaid, I felt alone, and I didn't know my value in the job marketplace. It's a very opaque market. So I used Hired.com to find a new position. Hired connected me with a talent advocate who guided me through the process, like a free concierge. They made me feel valued. It was like a white glove service. And this talent advocate helped me with all the questions I had. Should I ask for more money? Should I consider relocating to try to get a higher salary or a better job? The talent advocate that you get paired with on Hired.com helps you with all these kinds of questions. I got several job offers, and I found one that was a good fit. In fact, engineers who use Hired.com get an average of five offers from great companies like Facebook, Uber and Stripe, and the companies are bidding on you to try to get the best engineers, and so you end up with the higher salary. Go to Hire.com slash SE Daily for a $4,000 bonus upon signing up. It is completely free to engineers looking for a job. I've interviewed the founder of Hired, Matt Mitchkovich. He also started 99designs and SitePoint. He's a software engineer, and he understands that engineers deserve the leverage in this super competitive market where great engineers are at a premium. Check out Hired.com slash SE Daily. I'm happy to advocate Hired to my listeners because it puts power in the hands of engineers. Now let's get on with the show. Software engineering is being used to reduce prison recidivism and employ former prisoners with new technological skills. The Last Mile is an intensive six-month entrepreneurship program at San Quentin State Prison in California. Wes Bailey is the Director of Program Operations for The Last Mile. Wes, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Well, thank you very much for having me, Jeff. I appreciate it. The Last Mile is this software entrepreneurship program that you are involved in. How did this program get started? The, the story on that is uh, the, uh, the program was started by a couple of venture capitalists, Chris Redlitz and Beverly Parente, and they have been involved in funding tech firms here um, for many years in the San Francisco area. Uh, and uh, Chris uh, Redlitz was invited just randomly by a friend one day about five years ago to visit San Quentin Prison and talk to some of the inmates about entrepreneurism. And he, uh, the way he tells the story, he expected to spend about 30 to 40 minutes giving his presentation and leave. And he wound up spending almost three hours answering a lot of questions from these guys because they were so enthusiastic, they were so engaged. And he said that he left that day feeling just this buzz of possibility about uh, how much talent there was uh, rotting away behind the walls in San Quentin prison. And, and he immediately had this idea to create an incubator uh, of, or an accelerator of some kind in San Quentin Prison. Mm-hmm. Uh, and at that point, uh, it, was, it, it was a big ask, and it was, it was not really feasible because a program like that had never been run before. So he started with something that was a little bit closer to home for him, which was uh, an entrepreneurship program. That's how The Last Mile got started, as a program that was uh, teaching inmates um, – uh, business development skills, mm. presentation skills. And so the idea was sort of in the vein of if you were a, a tech entrepreneur and you had an idea that you wanted to pitch to some venture capitalists to get funding for, how would you approach that? You'd develop your business plan. You'd have a really great idea. You'd, you'd think it through. Uh, you would develop a pitch deck. 
you would uh, you would develop your pitch so that you could give that pitch at any time, uh, any place, uh, and, and really do it well. And so that's what the program focused on for about the first four years. Uh, and and at, was, at what point did you get involved? I started uh, as a volunteer not quite two years ago. Uh, I was working for a, uh, a software coding school here in San Francisco, um, and uh, they the last mile uh, contacted us, and they wanted to uh, find out if we'd be interested in helping them develop a curriculum for the last mile coding program. Mm -hmm. So at that point, they had been, I guess, maybe three and a half to four years, they'd been actually operating the last mile entrepreneurism program at San Quentin. So they had uh, developed a lot of goodwill. And uh, there was a lot of, uh, of, of momentum behind this idea. Uh, hey, let's start a coding program. Let's teach these guys mm -hmm. how to write software, how to be web developers specifically. Nobody thought that it could be done. Nobody thought that, number one, nobody thought that the guys would be able to learn it, which I think is really kind of preposterous uh, if you meet these guys. Uh, other than the fact they're in prison, I think that they pretty much represent the spectrum of people you meet on the streets. Some are extremely sure. intelligent. Some of them are not. And the premise that we have is that over 85% of the inmates in California prisons at some point will be released. If they don't have job skills when they're released, then there's a much, much higher chance that they're going to reoffend and return to the prisons. Mm -hmm. So just to give you a, a thumbnail, across the board in California prisons, the recidiv recidivism rate is about 65 to 67% uh, within three years. For inmates who participate in, in work-based programs, uh, like that which the last mile is training for, there's about an 8% recidivism rate. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge, huge drop-off in the number of, uh, of inmates that, that leave and are not able to find work and reoffend and, and you know hurt someone uh, and then return. Sure. So that's what we're trying to avoid. Sure, absolutely. So you got contacted, and at that point you were doing the coding boot camp, and um, what were the... I mean, were there were there certain certain things that you had learned at the coding boot camp about um, how the, how the average person can learn to code like like I think something that's that's uh, you, that's that certainly that we've uncovered or discussed on software engineering daily when we're interviewing people from coding boot camps is the or coding schools however you want to call them I think there was this notion maybe like as soon as recently as five or ten years ago, that people who learned to code when they were in their infancy or when they were like seven years old or ten years old, you know, there's this myth of this like ten or twelve year old programmer that grows up to be Mark Zuckerberg, and that's the only type of person that should ever learn to code or that could ever learn to code. And this has been sort of um, dis this myth has been kind of dispersed. Over the last, uh, you know, two to three, four or five years, um, it, which has kind of coincided with the rise of these coding boot camps, as we've seen people who enter these boot camps with no coding experience, they put their nose to the grindstone and they learn to code as well as or better than any five or seven year old prodigy, um, you know, who who grew up to be a, a Mark Zuckerberg type. Um, so, so I'm curious if that if that myth and dispersal of the myth is consistent with your experience and how that uh, that applies to what you were thinking when you were uh, approached to do the, the, the last mile? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and um, I guess touches on a number of points. I, I think probably the, the place I would start is um, the, the assumptions that we made when we started creating the curriculum for the first iteration of the last mile. Uh, we, we literally knew nothing. We, we had absolutely no idea uh, because at that point I had not met or interviewed any of the inmates who were applying for the program. Uh, we didn't, uh, all we knew is for sure we would not have any internet access inside the prison. So that's something that is uh, uh, really uh, something that we've, we've struggled with and have finally come up with a solution for much later in the process. But at first we just were prohibited from having any internet access. We were... Um, uh, not given uh, Apple machines, which is what we normally would use in uh, code schools because most of the code schools and a lot of development is done in, uh, in the Mac environment. So we were given some recycled uh, Hewlett-Packard machines uh, that had Linux, Ubuntu, uh, installed on those. 
Uh, and we were able to install some of the software that we wanted to use, like Sublime Text Editors. We used Google Chrome and Firefox as our, as our browsers. Uh, and we were able to download uh, discrete files, things like jQuery or Angular, um, a bootstrap, things that were self-contained that we could use. But we weren't able to link to a lot of the resources that are available online, things like Mozilla Developer Network or some of the much more you know, robust documentation sets. So there were some real challenges involved in just how we were even going to deliver this ocean of content that we're all accustomed to just being online. None of that was available to these guys. Um, and we also had to make uh, some guesses at what level they would enter at. Um, with a code school, uh, our, our methodology was to try to find the cream of the crop, obviously, because most code schools not only have a business model based on um, uh, taking um, a fee for the curriculum, but then they'll also help to place the students and frequently will take a, a commission based on the salary uh, of the students. So that's something that, uh, uh, you know, normally a code school is looking for the best of the best. With our program, we were trying to be as inclusive as possible. So we didn't want to necessarily try to give some sort of technical interview uh, and, uh, you know, weed out just the very best. We wanted to open it up as wide as possible to, to guys who might not have ever had such an opportunity. Mm. And that's really what it turned out to be. Uh, I would say better than 50% of the students that uh, came in to the first class had never touched a computer before in their lives. And I would say on average, they were incarcerated more than 15 years. We had a number of students that were incarcerated in more than 20, a few over 25 years. So these guys had been in prison since before the Internet existed. Wow. Um, and that's really astonishing because um, we, we had, uh, obviously, they've seen references to the Internet on television and in movies, but most of them have never had a single actual online experience. And uh, it got me thinking, where else in the world would you find a control group of adult males who had never touched a computer and had never been online? Yeah, so, so what, really are the, what, are, what are the behavioral differences between a, uh, you know, how, so how old would somebody be like? This would be like, four, like a 40-year-old, you're saying like a 40-year-old male that has never seen the internet before, that has only read about it in books or magazines. Yeah, right? exactly. So exactly. what are the cultural differences like did were there was there a time where you said uh you know x and then they're like they have no idea what you're talking about and you're like oh my gosh this is something that i take for granted because i'm attached to the internet all the time well there were some uh, one one thing that just comes to mind immediately which was an interesting uh incorrect answer that i got from more than a couple of guys that was actually it made a lot of sense if you didn't have any basis uh, when we first started introducing HTML, um, the way the way I did it was just to open up a, a, a text editor on one side of the screen and open up um, Google Chrome on the other side of the screen, load a very simple HTML document that had a couple of H1 tags, a couple of H2 tags, a couple of P tags, and and then that rendered on on the screen. And to show the guys you know, here's your text editor, this is actually the code, and then this is what is rendered from the code, and just to get their impressions as to what was going on. Something as basic as I could possibly make it to see, you know, to sort of gauge what the starting point was. And um, to see if they would intuitively make these connections between this code that's used for layout versus the rendered code that's in the browser. Mm. Uh, and um, so, for example, I, I just, by chance, made an H1 tag, an H2 tag, an H3 tag. And in my mind, I thought, well, we'll see if they can intuitively uh, tell that that's why these are getting progressively smaller in the rendered window. But instead, I get answers like, well, this must be the, the first one. This is line one. This is line two. This oh, is line no. Two. Which, when you think about it, makes a lot of sense. Sure, absolutely. That, that's completely valid intuition. Completely wrong. But uh, it's the sort of thing that, uh, you know, where else would you, would you see something like that? Uh, of course, I don't know. I, I just not run across that, that, that pattern before, but I, I saw a lot of that. Interpreting things in a way that seemed reasonable but was completely invalid because they had never been exposed to any sort of code before. Um, mm. So that, that was interesting. Um, and they still have not been online. None right. of these guys have been online. So we still don't know how they would actually interact with sites like 
Facebook or Amazon or Netflix. Right, certainly. So I, I do want to get into more of how the courses work, of how the last mile courses actually work. But before we get there, I want to get a little mo- more motivation of the meta for, for this. So like, we, you know, we live in a world where entrepreneurship is easier than ever before. We, You and I understand this. We've seen it in Silicon Valley and just people using computers all over the world. Um, does that mean that everyone should become an entrepreneur? And is that is that the conclusion that you guys are coming to at, with The Last Mile? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, and, and I don't think that that's a conclusion that I personally would ever make. And I feel safe in saying that that that's not the message of our founders either. Sure. Okay. Um, I believe um, my background is in business development and 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 creating companies. And uh, I mean, I do come from that world myself. But I think that it's a very um, uh, it can be a very difficult world. It's very demanding. Uh, you have to really have a strong motivation to create something and to follow through with making an idea work, even if you run into difficult times. Um, financial difficulty, difficulty marketing your product, to difficulty you know getting production, just a whole host of things that if you work as an employee, uh, you you don't have to handle sales, uh, customer service, uh, and and this is all part of being an entrepreneur uh, and taking those risks. I think that probably the most important thing about being an entrepreneur is the willingness and ability to take continued risk, even if it's a calculated risk. You're still taking risk and you're putting a lot on the line. That's so, but is really the goal? Forever. Is the goal to teach these people even though maybe maybe you want to be an entrepreneur, maybe you don't, maybe you want to be an employee, but even if you are going to be, be an employee, you should at least know the basis of entrepreneurship? Is that is that the mission? Or? I think that, the number one, I think the reason that the Last Mile program started off as an entrepreneurism program was because that was where the, the skill set of the founders uh, really, really was at its strongest they had been working for a couple of decades with entrepreneurs, with young uh, CEOs, uh, coaching them, helping them develop their products, helping them take it through seed funding into, into funding and exit round funding, uh, and, uh, and, and to find that type of success. So that's where they had a lot of experience. So, so, so this was really for the targeted at the prisoners that wanted to become an entrepreneur or maybe wanted to learn more about entrepreneurship to see if they wanted to become an entrepreneur. But it wasn't yeah, necessarily it, saying, we want to take everybody and teach them entrepreneurship. Well, I think that there are a lot of great skills as far as entrepreneurism goes that can benefit everyone. Whether or not you, you take that skill set that you've learned uh, and then actually apply it to a real business that you create, mm. that's that's another decision entirely. Right. But I'll say that um, one of the things that makes creating a business uh, uniquely enticing to to inmates who are released is that there is quite a bit of stigma that is attached in our society to uh, formerly incarcerated people. Yep. You know, this is a social conversation that's underway right now across the country. And uh, there's a, there are a huge number of people who are incarcerated in this country. It really touches the lives of more people than you would think when you start talking with people. Uh, I meet people every day who uh, make a comment, yes, my, my brother, my cousin, someone I know has been incarcerated. Uh, and it really touches a lot of lives. Mm. So the stigma that follows these people, uh, even if they're highly intelligent, highly motivated people, uh, in getting a job, um, hopefully that conversation will change. But if they're intelligent and motivated, then creating their own business is a viable option for them. Mm -hmm. And so that's also something that when you think about it in brass tacks, some of the things that they were doing that got them in trouble in the first place AKA maybe selling drugs, that's actually a type of entrepreneurism. Yep. You know, they're they're handling a product, they've got a they've got a supply chain, they've got distribution, they may have salesmen, they're collecting money. Uh, so a lot of the same things that they were already doing are things that if they were just working in a different industry, would they would have been highly successful. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that you have a lot of um, a lot of of uptake on that right. uh, naturally because of the the background that a lot of these guys have and and many of them are extremely motivated i'll say this the the guys who are in our program are the most engaged group of students i've, I've ever seen anywhere mm. just fantastically involved and engaged and enthusiastic so yeah that's okay that's super interesting so i mean I, i'd love to get into the 
discussion of curriculum. Like on, on Software Engineering Daily, we've done several shows about these coding boot camps, as I mentioned. How how does the curriculum of a coding boot camp compare to that of the last mile? Well, that's uh, that's a pretty expansive question because we have boot camps that really run the gamut from more entry level programs part-time programs, all the way up to much more advanced programs uh, that are targeted toward full stack engineering or, uh, or, or even things like uh, data processing, da- data analysis, rather. Um, so there, there's a real gamut of, of what those, those different niches um, cover. Uh, Are you we, saying within uh, the last mile, there's a gamut of different types? No, no, within within the gamut of schools. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Sort of curriculum. Yeah. So I would say um, what we have done because we're in the we our actual specialty is is delivering these programs inside the prison systems uh, and going through the you know the political and the procedural and logistical um, you know machinery there and uh, getting our program actually operating in the prisons. But sure. we're not in the curriculum development business. So what we've done is partner with uh, a number of, uh, of vendors, some proprietary and some open source, to create and provide a curriculum for us. Uh, a couple of our, our code school vendors are Hackbright Academy here in San Francisco sure. and General Assembly, uh, which is a much larger international school. Uh, they're really enthusiastic partners of ours. And uh, they're providing us with uh, curriculum from their front-end web development course, uh, their back-end web development course, and then two or three others, project management, uh, UX uh, design. So we have a number of different uh, curriculum tracks that we are going to be introducing. Right now, we're focusing only on front-end web development. And that has largely been driven by, uh, A, it being a really good starting point. It's sort of the basis for everything else. And B, because we really didn't have any servers that were running inside the environment that we could we could deliver content and anything more interesting than a flat file structure. So that is a problem that we've solved. As a matter of fact, we are building our first prototype server um, sitting right next to my desk <laughs> right now, about six feet tall, and it's a uh, uh, pretty, pretty nice uh, piece of equipment. It's going to go into San Quentin within the next month, uh, and it will be... Uh, the, the prototype for what our hardware infrastructure will look like going forward in all of our facilities. So this um, is an intranet, basically. It is a local area network, and what we'll be doing is um, we, we've actually got a fairly sophisticated configuration developed where uh, we have multiple uh, virtual machines running, one that will be uh, an administrative side machine that will allow us to access the machine through the Internet uh, for things like content updates and, and maintenance and then there will be a sandbox local area network that the inmates will be able to access. Okay, um, and, and just, just in case people like lost track at some point and didn't catch this, mm-hmm. the motivation for this is because you cannot have an internet connection. For, a prisoner cannot have an internet connection. Yeah, that is correct. It is right. prohibited in the, in the state guidelines for prisons for any inmate to have any internet access at any time. Right. So they're very, very strict about that, understandably, for a variety of security reasons. Uh, so our premise is that we're teaching something. We're teaching front-end web development, which is something that is extremely Internet-centric. All of the tools, all of the development, they are, they're handled online. If you download packages from Bower or NPM or uh, any of the uh, online package installers, Homebrew for Mac, uh, you need to have Internet access. That's something that we did not have. So right now what we're doing is creating this pretty robust um, local area network and server environment that will allow us to, uh, number one, run our, our educational content through a learning management system that we have created, uh, which is a full stack Django platform. Uh, and we're using that to aggregate all of the uh, curriculum content that our curriculum partners provide to us, whether it's written uh, book content, video content, um, code exercises, all of that will run through our LMS and then we'll also be able to deliver other assets through this internet, like NPM packages. Wow. Um, uh, also, GitHub has donated GitHub Enterprise to us. So we'll be able to run that at each of our uh, installations. Uh, so we'll be able to teach Git right from day one, uh, and uh, the students will learn that. Uh, Mozilla uh, has very graciously worked with us to create uh, an offline version of the Mozilla Developer Network. And uh, we are, uh, we're going to be including that. I think it's one of the best resources available 
uh, for anyone who is working in web development, a fantastic canonical resource that's going to be available to our students. So, um, so take me through one of these things. Like, for example, okay, so you've got this local server stack that you're building, and you want to be able to have npm on uh, as, as an accessible resource for for the prisoners that are building their web applications you know if, if you know i am I, I am not in prison so if i wanted to access npm i just do npm install whatever and it give it goes to the server somewhere and it gets me that package but the challenge of the last mile is that you have to be able to do npm install you know x and get x from this local server so how do you how do you do that well it, 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 actually in the exact same way that you would online uh, when you type in npm install uh that resolves through a dns server to wherever you know whatever the ip address is of that that resource uh we'll be running an nginx dns server that will resolve uh, all of the domains which are fairly limited set but that's that's one of them. For example, it, you would you would go to GitHub uh, and you would uh, you would push your repos to GitHub, or you would clone a, a, a repo. Same thing there. We'll just create uh, in, in the lookup table on our DNS server these these different addresses, uh, and it will be exactly the same as they would see in the real world. So it, it will look and feel like they're online, but they won't be. Mm, okay. And the the important thing there is that we're teaching them these skills that will be used in their uh, their their daily work as a developer. So if we don't create an environment that looks exactly like that, then they're going to be learning something that is just a proxy for something later on. They'll have to unlearn that. And yeah. They'll immediately be unfamiliar with it. So we're taking great pains to make it as close as possible to reality. So what are the other challenges to teaching without an internet connection? Well, one of the biggest challenges uh, that we, we know we'll be facing more as we scale to other prisons is the fact that um, it is, it's not really feasible to have um, full-time software engineering instructors on site at all of our facilities. Um, at San Quentin Prison, because it's less than 20 miles outside of San Francisco, you know, we're blessed for choices as far as uh, a lot of software engineers who are really enthusiastic volunteers with our program. So, so two or three times a month, we can take a group of engineers out to San Quentin and they can spend a lot of one-on-one -on -one time working with the guys in the program uh, to help them with their code, to do code reviews, to, to do breakout sessions, teaching them you know, specific things, to work with them on, uh, on learning. Uh, and that's great because one-on-one -on -one instruction is, is always the best. Um, we have also received funding from the state to, uh, to roll out our program in Ironwood State Prison, which is in Southern California, way out in the desert near the Arizona border. It is just about as remote as a prison could be. Uh, and we will be deploying within the next, I would say, six weeks. We'll be starting our program there. We've been in pre-production for a few months on that. Uh, and we have also just received funding for two more prisons, which are both going to be women's facilities. Uh, California Institute for Women outside of Los Angeles and Folsom Women's Prison uh, right outside of Sacramento and Folsom. So uh, those two facilities, even though they're a bit closer to civilization, um, they're still not going to have the volume of, uh, of volunteers that we would have here in mm -hmm. San Francisco. So our, our solution for this is, uh, number one, video conferencing. Um, we are specifying fast internet service into the classroom as far as the server um, that the instructor or the class facilitator who will be on site at all times uh, will have access to a projector where we will be able to do uh, live video conferencing ah. with, uh, with someone who is a software engineer who can either teach a class or they can do Q&A sessions, uh, just a variety of video content. Um, that they can they can uh, deliver to these mm. different facilities, and that's how we intend to be able to scale. Even though we don't necessarily have the engineering talent uh, everywhere, we'd like to scale the program. Well, what's interesting about this the scaling talent question is like um, I've done some shows about the U.S. Digital Service, and what's interesting about the U.S. Digital Service is you see some technologists who are just overjoyed to go work at the USD, or maybe overjoyed is the wrong word, but they are. It's sort of like, you know, they've had enough of the startup cycle or whatever, and, and they want to find a way to 
you know, apply their software technical skills to something that will give them a real feeling of meaning. And um, one way to do that is U.S. digital service, you know, in, in uh, injecting technology into the government. But certainly, certainly another way is 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 something like the last mile, where you're taking these um, this this giant untapped resource of intelligence and um, and and enabling it with with modern skills. So, um, you know, with that in mind, I, I, I would, I'd love to talk more about just the um the 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 battles of of teaching I shouldn't say battles but the the process of teaching students um you know like one of the the things I see you know I, I saw this in college among my peers and certainly among myself and you see it at coding boot camps is students that are new to coding they frequently encounter imposter syndrome which yes. it's yeah. so, so it's totally rampant in the world of technology and imposter syndrome happens when there's a disconnect between the skills that a person has and the the perception of of themselves so so do you do you see imposter syndrome in the students at San Quentin where they cannot convince themselves that they're capable of doing this? Yeah, absolutely. And and if anything, I think it's it's more intense uh, with this population. Um, this is a group of people who largely have been told their entire life that they're failures. Uh, many of them have been in prison uh, many times. Uh, many of them have extremely disadvantaged backgrounds. And uh, so they are not accustomed to being given an opportunity to do something, um, to, to, to be uh, addressed with the assumption that, hey, you can do this. They're, they're more accustomed to hearing, well, you can't do this. There, there's no reason for you to even try. Mm -hmm. We're going in and we're saying, hey, this is just about the most complex thing that humanity has ever done. Why don't you give it a try? Uh, and uh, they're they're astonished. I think uh, that at first they're astonished that we would even uh, presume to give them an opportunity to do this. Um, but uh, I, I think that the the truth of the matter about imposter syndrome, whether it's in prison or not, is it's it's sort of inversely proportional to experience. Um, you you start off with a skill set that you learn at a very accelerated rate if you go through a, a boot camp, for example. And typically, the, the people in my experience going through boot camps are probably 80% male, and they are between the ages of 25 and 35. So that's, that's typically your subset with a, with a boot camp here in San Francisco that I've seen. Um, the, those, those individuals don't have as much work experience, uh, and they are transitioning to a, uh, a field that may be completely different than the field that they were in. So they may have real skills. They may have real capabilities because they've been doing uh, some work on their own or open source work or something that has built bona fide capabilities, but they just haven't ever done it and gotten paid for it. And they don't really know what they're going to run into. And that's a scary proposition. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing with these guys. They are in an environment where they're even further removed from it. They're not working. They're going to a classroom where they don't even have connectivity and by the way, they're leaving that classroom and going back to their prison cells. So they're, they're overcoming a mountain of a sort of psychological adversity. Uh, and um, I have, I've had a conversation with numerous inmates in our program that falls along the lines of, I don't know if I'll ever actually do this in real life, but the fact that I'm even doing it now is something I never thought that I could do. Mm -hmm. I never thought that I could engage with something like this. I never thought that I could even learn something like this. So for me, that's really profound uh, that just going through the experience of trying this, just getting the opportunity to, to try to do this is a really profound pivot in their personal uh, evaluation of their own potential. If they can do that, then, then who knows what they actually will do, but they've got a much better chance of doing something really positive with their lives. Engineers love automation, and Wealthfront automates your investing. As a software engineer, there are certain processes that you want to execute no matter what, like integration tests during a build. 
you wouldn't execute integration tests manually. You would use a continuous integration tool like CodeShip or Jenkins to automate your integration tests. Wealthfront is a tool to automate investing. Just like a continuous integration tool runs your tests automatically, Wealthfront can reinvest your dividends automatically and perform tax loss harvesting automatically. To get your first $15,000 managed by Wealthfront for free, go to Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily and get started with Wealthfront's layer of automation on top of your portfolio. Wealthfront.com slash SE Daily. Check it out. It would support Software Engineering Daily, and you will get $15,000 managed for free if you sign up. Automate your investing. Get back to the things that you can't automate, like writing code. So do you think there's a narrative in our society that beyond your 20s or maybe you're beyond your 30s or something, your neuroplasticity is gone and you can no longer learn and you should continue just doing the things that you've learned up until you were 35 or something? I absolutely reject that. I feel the same way. I reject that very, very strongly. do (laughs) Do you agree that there is a narrative that is something like that? Well, I think that that narrative narrative is something that has been around for a while, that you find what you do, you do it forever, and you become entrenched in whatever you were doing. Now, I'm a big fan of, of uh, developing a skill to a high potential and having real craftsmanship and appreciation for doing something very, very well. And sometimes that involves doing something for a while before you can reach that level of expertise. But that doesn't mean that you are locked into something in your life that you can never have growth in another direction. Mm. For, for me, the most compelling thing about this program, The Last Mile, personally for me, is this, this theme of, of reinvention. It's very important to me that we continue expanding for our whole lives uh, through learning, through experiences, through positive interactions, through things that allow us to keep growing. And I firmly believe that when we stop growing, we start dying. We start collapsing mm-hmm. in on ourselves. And we start, uh, we start this process of death when we give up on that expansion. So mm-hmm. I'm 51 years old. Uh, I, I have reinvented myself three or four times in my adult life. Uh, and uh, I think that it's something that periodically you should, you should go through and, and learn a completely new skill if it excites you, if it's interesting mm-hmm. to you. There may be a new avenue for uh, another growth phase in your life. I think that that's what these guys have in front of them. They have mm. an opportunity to engage with something really special, something that they haven't had the opportunity to before, and it may not be for all of them. I don't believe that coding is a panacea. Everybody should learn to code and it's going to solve all the world's problems. That's ridiculous. But I do think that because computers and software are such an integral part of our society, and they're going to continue to be, that it's always good and it's always going to help someone, and no matter what job they're doing, if they have some basic understanding of code. So from that aspect, I think it's very valuable. So I'm a student at the last mile, and I come in for the first day, what, wh- the first day of coding lessons. What do I learn on the first day? Well, I'll tell you where we started and I'll tell you where we are now because this is something that we really learned a lot uh, from our first iteration. When we, we just graduated our second six-month program and uh, next month we'll start our third. When we first started, we knew absolutely nothing about what the entry point would be for the students. So we, you know, we, we gave them some text editors. We gave them some curriculum. We started with JavaScript writing functions sort of out of the playbook of the code school that we were, uh, we were working with. And we found out almost immediately that was completely overwhelming. It was, it was too advanced an entry point oh, no. for the students. So we dialed it back and we, we learned uh, that obviously guys who had never touched a computer didn't know how to type. They, didn't, they weren't comfortable with a keyboard. They didn't know what all these F keys across the top were and what's this command key or this control key. They had no idea what this mm. was. They didn't know how to use a mouse. Uh, so, um, I wound up going out one day, probably the second week of the program and just doing a seminar on how to turn your machine on, how to turn the screen on, what happens if a cable gets loose, um, 
you know, how the mouse works, what the difference is between a left click and a right click. So uh, that's, that's literally where we had to start at the very, very beginning um, and, and then build up from there. These guys are extremely fast learners, but they just have not had the benefit of the experience that most of us get just through osmosis these days where we're you know, joined at the hip to a keyboard 22 hours of the day. Right. Um, these guys don't have that and they've never had that. Um, we've, we've refactored and we've really improved our curriculum going into the next course and we actually have a two week long foundations module which will start off with not only basics of how to, how to turn the machines on, how to handle the machines, uh, some typing uh, practice um, and that's something we're going to encourage them to practice every day through the course touch typing, but also some basis in just basic history of the internet. What's going on with the internet? What sorts of, what is the difference between a website and a web application? What does a web developer do? What are the different types of jobs that you could do as a web developer? Um, this gives them some context so that as they go through the course, they're not just learning something without really understanding how to apply it. Uh, I think that if they, if they understand what some of the possibilities for where they could grow, what sorts of work they could do, it's going to be a much more meaningful learning experience for them. So as they grow through this process, do, do they start just spending all their time away from class, like in their cell, reading reading O'Reilly books and like practicing on a paper keyboard or yes. how... The short answer is yes. Wow. <laughs> I, I haven't heard the paper keyboard one. That's a great idea. But um, we we are permitted to give them uh, soft cover textbooks. Hard cover texts are prohibited in, uh, in the California prisons. But uh, we're permitted to give them soft cover books. So we have a number of, uh, um, of coding books that are part of the library. And we're actually just getting ready to place an order for uh, quite a few more so that we can bolster that. Um, at San Quentin Prison... The schedule is Monday through Thursday, 6.30 a.m. to 2.30 in the afternoon. So mm. they are not in class Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And that's a long time for somebody who's learning how to code. Most, most coding students have a laptop that they carry around with them literally all the time. And uh, so they, um, three days is a long time to, to not be working. So these guys have actually put together sort of ad hoc um, study groups uh, and some of the more advanced students are now leading some of these groups, and they're whiteboarding functions. They're they're whiteboarding wow. algorithmic problems, uh, and they are they they've got composition notebooks, so they can do homework. They can they can do these assignments on their own, uh, and it's a great opportunity for guys who are working at different speeds to uh, to either do remedial work on things that they're struggling with, or to maybe read some stretch content on something that is uh, over and above. What is a success story look like? Do you, do you have any, like, the, for example, like the, gu the guys that are leading the classes, how far along does their, has their knowledge gotten? Do they understand object-oriented programming through and through? Or how, like how far through the typical computer science or programming curriculum have they gotten? That's a, that's a good question. And uh, I, I alluded a minute ago that we have a very widely varying um, capability um, of guys when they enter the program. Most of the guys have never had any experience at all, but we do have a few guys who have actually had some computer background and, and even a couple of guys who have had computer science training. Um, we have not taught JavaScript as an object-oriented language within the, within the framework of the class so far. Typically, when you get into OOP and JavaScript, you're talking more of full-stack um, back-end work, although if you're using a, a framework like Angular, uh, obviously you've got a lot of object-oriented uh, work there as well, or, or Backbone, or really any MVC. But we have not really intro introduced any MVCs so far um, for a couple of reasons. Um, there are only a handful of guys who are ready for that at this point, um, and we're, we're focusing really on solid uh, design-oriented front-end uh, developer skills um, we are planning to expand our, we've actually got two courses now, a track one and a track two class. So the, the total course is one year long. So students will go through the first six month course. Uh, and at the end of that class, they should have very good familiarity with, um, HTML, CSS, with JavaScript as it relates to manipulating the DOM. Uh, they're, they're not going to have a lot of 
um, compound function capability. They're not going to be able to write, map, or reduce from the ground up, uh, but they are going to be able to understand uh, creating iterators, uh, you know, addressing variables, uh, the basics of JavaScript. Sure. Uh, in track two, in our new curriculum, we will dive straight into what you would think of as computer science fundamentals, uh, data structures, uh, algorithms, and um, uh, really object-oriented fundamentals. Mm-hmm. Um, the goal here is not, at this point, not to get into full-stack development, but to have a really solid understanding of JavaScript as an object-oriented language so that they can start, uh, we can start integrating model view controller frameworks and make them much more capable front-end developers. Now, I will say that as a success measure, because our program is so young, we have not had uh, any inmates who've gone through the coding curriculum uh, actually uh, who have been released yet. Uh, I think the soonest one that actually has a solid release date is about 10 months from now. Uh, and he has gone through the entire one-year class and is now um, a candidate for our joint venture program, which is pretty exciting. This will actually be a working development shop inside San Quentin Prison. And we have six candidates right now who have graduated both track one and track two, and they are queued up for, uh, for being a part of this joint venture program. And the goal for that is to actually solicit work uh, which we're in the process of right now um, developing clientele who will hire our developers in San Quentin to to create web pages and, and web apps for them. Describe the transformation that you see in the mood and the the posture of the students that have gone through the last mile. I will say that uh, overwhelmingly, appreciation for the opportunity is the most profound thing that you see. These guys are, I, I, I believe, uh, because we vet our, our candidates for our program very carefully, um, they're at a point in their development where they are ready to, to make this transition to something completely different in their lives. And they are very grateful for the opportunity, and they are very um, enthusiastic about their futures, and really, really positive. Um, our program is sort of a capstone program. It's not the first program that an inmate is going to, uh, to go through. Um, if, if there are any sort of drug addictions or alcoholism or any sort of uh, anger management issues, there are other programs that are designed for those sorts of things. Um, by the time an inmate is ready for our program, they've gone through perhaps, well, they've certainly gotten their GED and perhaps they've gone through some college programs. They've gone through some other corrective programs to work on other behavioral issues that they need to address, and uh, they've, they've succeeded in that, and now they're reinventing themselves from a career standpoint. Mm. Um, the, the, the fact that they have gotten the opportunity to do that, I think, is, is just amazing to them that uh, after really not, for the most part, being given much opportunity in their lives, now they're getting a great opportunity. And I think they really, really are enthusiastic about that. Mm. So what motivates you to work on the last mile? It is this extremely positive uh, group of people who are working to give people the opportunity to have a different and better life. Uh, The theme of reinvention is probably the most important thing for me that drives me. Uh, different people that are involved with this program have different motivations. Many of them have family or friends who have had, you know, been touched by incarceration in, in one way or another. Um, and, and everyone has a different story as, as to what their entry point is. But for me, the thing that continues to drive me is creating something that is a, a lifelong learning experience uh, and creating um, uh, a, a, this this product where we're trying to deliver this curriculum in a really difficult environment. This is a very challenging uh, environment working inside a prison, working without internet connectivity, working through a lot of uh, uh, skepticism by some people uh, in in the the, the state uh, who didn't believe that it could be done. I will say that at this point, we have got some fantastic support by the California Department of Corrections and California Prison Industries, two of our partners, who are helping to make this a reality. Um, they see what we're doing. We have got really enthusiastic support uh, from Sacramento, which I'm, I'm grateful for because uh, without that, it would be impossible 
to uh, deliver this program. So I, I think just generally the overwhelming um, understanding that we need to do something different. There's something fundamentally wrong with the way we're handling incarceration and we're not really rehabilitating people. And this is a, a real serious effort to do that. Absolutely. I mean, the certainly the 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 recidivism the recidivism rate is um is astounding and i mean in the united states particularly we have this prison industrial complex and there are some really bad incentives in place that keep our prisons so full given that you've seen this problem up close what is at the root of the prison industrial complex <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure that I'm qualified to give a definitive judgment on oh, that. Oh, okay. Uh, but I, I think that you're you're absolutely right when you say it's a huge industrial complex. It is um, it's motivated in some ways by money. Uh, it's motivated in some ways by uh, by jobs, um, by the uh, the authentic desire to keep the public safe in some ways. Um, and and uh, I, I think that there are a lot of conflicting and, and sometimes counterproductive motivations. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, no one thinks that someone should be unjustly incarcerated. But, I, you know, I believe that it happens. Uh, I think that we would like to have an ideal prison system where only the people who need to be in prison are in prison. And when they are there, they're learning to be better people so that they can have a better life upon release. I don't think that's what happens uh, a, a lot of the time. And I think that anything that we can do to start the wheels turning on, on a more progressive way to not just lock people up and forget about them, but to help them pivot their lives in a way that is going to positively impact them, that's a good thing. Uh, so it's, 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 Go ahead. I was going to say, in the optimistic version of the future, we will start to move, who knows what the timeline is on this, we will start to move towards fewer, I mean, if you and I had our way, we would start to move towards an area where there's fewer inmates, more people are getting released, probably, we have uh, more, I don't know, speedy due process, or whatever, I, I don't know the situation, um, boots on the ground level, uh very well, but I, you know, I would assume that there are way too many people, um, and many of them don't deserve to be in there. But like, a, a, as as these people start to get out of prison, um, you know, like we we talk about diversity on Software Engineering Daily, uh, and we try to, uh, you know, it's it's you know, most of the people we have on the show, I won't lie, are white male programmers. Um, we try to we try to do our best to find people who do not fit that mold. Um, but you know, this is, this is a, this is a narrative in the, uh, in the tech media. And I think it's, it's a good one because, um, you know, if all of our engineers are white upper middle class males, that's how we end up with only social media apps and food delivery companies and applications that only solve the problems of white upper middle class males. And that's not good. It's not a good thing. Um, so, you know, as, uh, I guess, you know, in a more modern context, the question I'm trying to ask is like, what are the types of problems that the tech entrepreneurs of San Quentin would be able to solve? As far as creating applications to solve a problem? Or if, what are the, what are the types of problems? Like, what are the, what are the types of problems that they come up with in these classes? Cause I know there are, you know, there are. Um, you know, there are sessions that are like brainstorming or more sort of more higher level, like how do you build a business type of discussions where you're maybe not talking about the, 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 you know, object oriented programming or, or, uh, computer science type of stuff. You're talking about businesses. So what are the types of businesses that, that, uh, the, the people in the last mile start to think of? Well, I can, I can give you a few examples from our recent demo day. On, uh, on December 9th, we graduated uh, our most recent class. And this was actually the first opportunity that we had to do a bona fide demo day where we had a kiosk set up with uh, six. There were six, uh, six groups of programmers in the class, and they developed six applications. And um, not only did they, did they pitch those uh, before the audience, but then afterward they were able to actually show the apps uh, to the media and the visitors. Uh, and a couple of those apps were actually 
uh, projects that were created uh, by former Last Mile inmates through the entrepreneurism program who had been released and are now back in their communities actually starting these businesses up. One of them uh, is called Healthy Hearts, and it is um, uh, the brainchild of a, a former inmate of San Quentin called uh, Horatio Hearts. And uh, Ray is a Last Mile member. I believe he was uh, in one of the first cohorts that went through. And his idea was to create this uh, uh, resource for community members um, in Pittsburgh, California, where he grew up. And there are what they call food deserts where there are, there's not access to a lot of fresh produce. Uh, there are a lot of, um, uh, it, within his population, uh, a lot of people who don't have good nutrition, uh, a lot of children who are not taught good nutrition uh, and fitness and exercise. And so his, his idea was to create uh, a website and a community center that would help to, um, you know, to deliver this sort of service to his community. Uh, another project called Teen Tech Hub, which is uh, not up and running yet, but is getting some momentum in Richmond, Virginia, is uh, another one of our um, uh, alumni, James Houston. Uh, and Teen Tech Hub was an idea for an after-school program to teach uh, kids between the ages of 9 and 14 basic coding skills. Not to make them programmers, but to get them in, interested in maybe going, maybe staying in school, maybe getting involved in STEM-related programs, going to college, and, and uh, maybe turning in a positive direction instead of turning in a negative direction like he had you know, when he was young. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, another program, which I thought was a terrific idea, was uh, called GPA, Get Parents' Attention. And uh, it's a, it was uh, the idea of one of the inmates who's still at San Quentin, uh, and he was an athlete. He was a football player uh, in high school, and he received several uh, offers for scholarships, but because his GPA was too low and nobody really monitored that, uh, he wasn't able to take advantage of any of these scholarships. And uh, he attributes that to him getting involved in crime. And instead of going to college, he wound up becoming you know, an inmate in San Quentin. Uh, so his idea behind this application was uh, coaches, parents, anybody who's involved with a student athlete would be able to keep track of their test scores and their attendance in class. And as soon as uh, their grades dip below a certain level that might make them ineligible to play their sports, mm -hmm. then the parents will get a, a text or an email uh, and, and the coaches will too. So something to foster communications. Um, so there are three examples of the type of, uh, of mindset and, and the sort of audience that, that um, our students are thinking of. Um, I think that you're absolutely right that if this, uh, if this industry continues in exactly the same demographic, we're going to get apps that look and feel the same and are targeted toward the, the, the same group of people. Um, I don't for the life of me understand why um, we don't have more uh, minority uh, entrepreneurism and, and minority companies. I think that this is a very accessible field. The, the cost of entry is nothing more than a laptop and some motivation. Mm -hmm. I really truly believe that. And I think that one of the things that is keeping people from doing it is a type of imposter syndrome, an, an imposter syndrome that they don't believe they can do something, so they never try. And the mm -hmm. only guaranteed way to fail is to not try. Yeah. Well, I mean, that idea uh, of the imposter syndrome being the bottleneck is both uh, heartbreaking and also extremely promising because it's not some sort of resource that is impossible to uh, find a a wealth of you know we can I, I we completely can, agree completely like, agree we, so I mean you know I know we're we're running up against time here but like you know I, I read this I read this interesting um, this book recently uh, by um, Tyler Cowen where he was talking about the future and he was talking about what what traits will make a good teacher in the future, like, you know, in the next decade or so. And he talked about China as a um, leading indicator. And one thing that's interesting in China is they have these, there are these rock star tutors. So there are these tutors in China that get paid like millions of dollars to to teach, you know, the, the really, really wealthy families of, you know, the kids from the really, really wealthy families in China. And the things that the, the the teachers excel at are oftentimes things that look more like coaching. 
Um, so, so when we talk about what is valuable for uh, for a teacher to understand in the future, it seems like it looks more and more like what we think of as valuable from a coach these days, which is which is oftentimes more like psychological uh, reinforcement, like letting the the students know that they can do it or whatever. Um, you know, it's I not as that, yeah. That that makes yeah. perfect sense to me, and I, I think yeah. that that's that's a very valid observation. Uh, I think that if you have if you have a child who has been taught that they can't do something, and they've been told this by their parents, by their teachers, by somebody who is older and whom they trust, they're probably going to believe them. Mm-hmm. And if, if that's what they're hearing again and again and again through their environment, through their friends, and it's being continuously reinforced, then there's just about a 0% chance that they're going to try that thing, even if it might be something that deep down inside they're interested in, that makes mm-hmm. them excited. But if they're told, no, you can't do it, a surprising number of people are not rebellious enough to try anyway. Yeah. And they really need to be. Uh, I, I really think that everything starts with an idea. It starts with a belief and it starts with an expectation that you're going to be able to do something. If you tell yourself that you, you're not going to succeed, well, then you're not. But if you tell yourself that you might succeed or better yet, that you expect to succeed, then you've got a way better chance of, of actually doing that. And then the question is, you know, what, it, what does success look like? What is that measure of success? Does it, does it mean that you learned to code and you immediately went out and got a six-figure job? I still think that's kind of unrealistic. I know that some of the code <laughs> schools want to, want to market that way. Uh, I don't think that that's, that's realistic. And I also think that it's not even necessary to still have a great career <laughs> no, and a great it's not. life. Yeah, that's kind of foolish. So setting unrealistically high expectations, it's kind of like saying, hey, I play football, therefore my game plan is to get a job working in the NFL, right? <laughs> playing football in the NFL or playing in the NBA. There just aren't that many jobs or what, two, mm-hmm. three hundred guys playing basketball professionally. You're probably not going to get that gig. I don't care how good you are. So something more realistic like, hey, I'll learn how to maybe write code or maybe I'll learn about starting a business or I'll do whatever it might be. It might be something completely different. Uh, but if, you, if you're excited by it, if it's something you want to do and you believe you can do it, I, I believe that you can do it. And that's something that is... Um, it's so easy. It's so easy to, to believe that, but it's so hard to have that shift in thinking if you've had it pounded into you that you can't. And yeah. I wish that that's something that our society could change. Definitely. Well, you're working on it, so we're that's doing, great. We're doing our part here, and uh, I think that we're having some impact. So That's uh, great. Well, um, well, Wes Bailey, thanks for coming on to Software Engineering Daily and talking about the last mile. Um, it's an inspiring program, and I'm, I'm happy to showcase it. And if you guys have any, any updates in the future, then feel free to come back on the show. Great. Jeff, thank you very much for having me on. I really enjoyed it.